Most candidates love to segment their data in their case interviews. They'll segment customers by age group, their company's costs by region or product line, and so on. Segmentations are one of the easiest ways to break your problem following the MISI principle. However, what if you pick the wrong segmentation criteria? My name is Bruno, I'm an ex-McKinsey consultant and the co-founder of Crafting Cases, where we teach you how to stand out in your case interviews by thinking like a top management consultant. And in this video, I'm gonna show you the fourth way to be missing your case interviews, segmentations. Now, this video is part of a broader series of videos called the five ways to be missing. So if you haven't watched the first video in this playlist, go here and watch that one first. Now, let's jump right into segmentations. Segmentations are basically slicing a problem according to one criterion. So for example, you can segment your customers by age or by income or by region or by how much they spent with you annually. You can segment your competitors by their market share or by how long they've been in the market. You can segment your products by, uh, by market share again, by price point, by margin, average margin. So there are infinite ways to segment whatever you're segmenting. But some of these ways are more insightful than others. Let's take a look at a couple of examples. So I'm gonna go through a few examples of segmentations and I'm actually gonna do the same examples in a less insightful way and in a more insightful way so you can see the contrast. So let's start with the first example. Why has a disposable diapers manufacturer market share dropped? So typical case question, I can segment that into why has it dropped in region A, region B and region C. So if it's a global manufacturer, I can do by continent or major countries. If it's a local manufacturer by region of the country. Now, this is not a very insightful way to structure this case for two reasons. First, I don't know if it has actually dropped more in a region than in the other. And this is true for every segmentation pattern, but there's no clue in the case question that it has dropped in one region more than in the others. The second reason why this is not very insightful is that if I find out it has dropped more in region A than region B, I still get no insight of why that might be, unless there are two completely different regions. Now, a more insightful way to do this same case is to divide by the babies segment of the market, the adult segment or the seniors, elderly segment of the market and the pet segment of the market. So diapers are sold to babies, to seniors and it's a small market, but growing to pets. So it's likely that the market share has dropped in one of these markets, not all of them because they actually sell their products completely different in these three markets. They're different markets. And if it has dropped in one market and not the other, I get some clues. I mean, if it's selling well with babies and adults, but not with pets, probably it's distribution, the problem, maybe branding. If it's selling well with uh, babies, but not with adults, the distribution is the same. It's very similar. So it's probably something related to branding or advertising. If it has fallen with all of them, I mean, there's not a lot in common between pets, babies and adults. So it's probably more on the supply side. So I can't know for sure, but I get some clues. So it's a more insightful way. Let's check another example. How should McDonald's think about its menu strategy? So uh, the, the types of products that they sell. A less insightful way to segment that is to segment into hamburgers, other foods, drinks, and desserts. So obviously other foods excludes desserts. Uh, so desserts take care of milkshakes, which are kind of drinks and, and also solid desserts as well. This is not very insightful because you have to think of the menu as a whole, not just uh, individual dishes necessarily. A more insightful way to think of the same case is to segment into breakfast, lunch, snacking, and dinner. 
Now lunch and dinner might be similar or they might not be similar, but these are different meals and I have to think of them in different ways. Now I'm not saying that I would choose segmentation as a messy structuring technique to do this case. I'd actually do it probably different, uh, but this is a more insightful way than the first. A third example, a hotel chain that has road motels, urban budget hotels and luxury resorts has seen a profit drop. What has happened? Now a less skilled candidate would segment this as by single travelers, couples and families. So has the profit dropped because we've lost some of the segments or they became less profitable or something like that. A more insightful way is, well, sometimes the answer is right under your nose. We can segment that into road motels, urban budget hotels, and luxury resorts. We can actually see if profit has dropped in all of them or in just one of them. They're different business. They happen to fall under the same hotel chain, but we can think of them separately. So the key insight here is there are less insightful ways and more insightful ways to segment the same case. Which brings us to the next topic, which is how to use segmentation. Because there's so much variation on how insightful these structures can be, there's actually a question of how to use them. There are three situations in which you want to use a segmentation. First, is to separate completely different problems. So if you have completely different problems, you want to separate them early on. The second situation where you want to use segmentations is to add more nuance on top of your core structures. And the third situation where you will want to use uh, segmentations is to find mix effects. If there is a high likelihood or you're suspicious that there might be mix effects going on. So let's tackle each one independently. The first situation where you want to use segmentations is when you have completely different problems. So back to our examples, in the diapers manufacturer market share problem, I've segmented into the baby's markets, the senior, mar the senior market and the pets market. And the reason why I did this is because these are completely different markets. So when tackling market share, we can't put all of them together. So another example of this, in the hotel chain profit decrease problem, I've segmented into the business line. So there's the road motels, there's the urban hotels and the luxury resorts. For all I know, these are three completely different businesses with completely different drivers and the brand could be similar or not but still these are different business lines. So it's different problems that you have to tackle in each one of them. So when you have different problems, you want to segment early on, maybe the first layer of your structure so that you can structure each problem separately or as soon as the problems become different. And that, that fact is for the simple reason that Different problems need to be separated before they can be solved. The second situation where you want to use segmentations is to add nuance to your core structure. So say that you have the diapers manufacturer problem to solve and you've segmented into babies, seniors and pets and you've discovered that your problem is in the babies market. So you're losing market share for baby diapers. Now you create a conceptual framework or an algebra framework uh, to, to find out the root cause of that problem. Now on top of that framework, as a deeper layer, you can add segmentations to get more nuance. So you can segment uh, your customers into low income customers, mid income and high income to see if you've lost market share in one of these uh, uh, income ranges or you can segment uh, by region so and you do that to get some hypothesis that you might not get otherwise so say that you only lost market share among low-income customers now one hypothesis that come from that is that you had a recent price increase and that was backlashed by customers and 
because low-income customers are more sensitive to price, you may get this hypothesis if you segment, and this is a kind of hypothesis that you could uh, have forgotten about had you not segmented. Or if you're losing market share in one specific region and not others, a hypothesis that comes from that is that you're weakening your ties with the distribution channel that is really strong in that region, but not so much in others. So when using segmentation to add nuance to your structures, you have to have in mind that you have to use them to generate hypotheses. And the reason for that is that segmentations won't tell you why something is happening. So it can tell you that the market share drop is worse among low income customers from region A, but it won't tell you why these customers uh, from this region aren't buying your product as much and they're buying products from your competitors more than that. To discover why you need to create a hypothesis and investigate that hypothesis to see if it's true or false and so on. So segmentations are powerful because they let you create these more targeted focused hypotheses that have more chances of being correct but because there's an infinite way to structure your problems through segmentations, there's an infinite uh, criteria that you can use to segment your cases. Uh, if you had to rely on segmentations alone in these types of cases, you'd have to have luck to pick the right segmentation criteria. However, if you use segmentations on top of more robust structures, and use them to create specific hypotheses that you can test, then you don't really have to be lucky and find the right segmentation pattern because you have a more robust structure backing it up and you're just using the segmentation to create better hypotheses that are easier to be tested, that are more likely to be correct. But there is one situation in which only segmentations will tell you why something's happening. And we call that the mix effect. Now the mix effect happens when nothing fundamental changes about the business, but the overall profile, the overall mix of the business, of the market you're in, of your customers change. And to better understand that the best way is through one example. So the mix effect happens when the averages of a number change despite no fundamental change in the drivers of that number. So let me give you an example. Let's say you were in a case interview and you got this chart. So the average price of baby diapers has dropped. So it seems like we're charging less for our products, right? So we went from 30 cents per diaper on average to 25 cents on average. But if you get the complete picture, if you ask to segment this data, that isn't necessarily true that we dropped our prices. It might be that our average price has dropped because the mix of sales has shifted to a lower price channel. So in this example, the price per diaper in the past and in the present for drugstores was on average 33 cents, in supermarkets on average 28 cents, and via e-commerce on average 21 cents. So that didn't change, nothing fundamental changed. But our customers who didn't buy in e-commerce back then started purchasing on e-commerce a lot. So we used to get 96% of our sales from drugstores and supermarkets and now 60% of our sales are e-commerce. So the average price has dropped, even though nothing really changed. We haven't changed our pricing. We haven't changed anything. Our customers changed the way they buy. So it's not that nothing really fundamental changed. I use that phrasing, but it's actually not really precise. The thing is, uh, what changed was not what's obvious. So if price dropped, it's the obvious thing to think about is that we've changed our pricing or that the retailers that sell our product have changed our pricing. However, in this case, it wasn't that that happened. What happened is that customers started shopping in lower priced channels. 
Now, I segmented into channels and by coincidence, it, it, it was the actual problem. It could be in package size. So larger packages have a lower average price per diaper uh, and customers are starting to buy larger packages than before. So this mix effect could happen in a series of situations. And the key to find them is to recognize that certain trends in the marketplace, in the way customers buy, or in anything that surrounds your business can have an effect in the weights of the averages. So every average is weighed by, uh, so for example, in distribution channels, there is a, a way of physical retail and another one for e-commerce. And if that shifts, your business may shift as well. Now, mix effects are really, really common in case interviews. And the reason they're common in case interviews is because they're really common in strategic projects or in projects that management consulting firms have to solve. So let's go a little bit into that just so you understand why this happens so often. I think it's going to make you more aware of these mix effects when they happen in your cases. So imagine you have a diapers company and it has three divisions. Let's say it's segmented by channel. So you have the drugstore sales division, you have the supermarket sales division, and you have the e-commerce division, which in the beginning is really tiny and it grows more over time. And imagine each of the heads of these divisions, they report to the CEO. And obviously there's also a manufacturing guy who reports to the CEO, but in the sales side, these three guys report to the CEO. Now, what happens as sales start to shift to e-commerce and less to retail? Well, if the market's growing, it is possible that e-commerce grows a lot, even though physical retail doesn't shrink. So what could be happening here is that these two guys, the drugstore guy and the supermarket guy, they're saying, yeah, growth is good. Our profits are good. Uh, nothing bad is happening. And then there's the e-commerce guy who's just having a really uh, uh, skyrocketing career because his division's growing so much. And he reports to the CEO that they're so healthy and that they're growing so much and such. So all of these three guys are not seeing any problem. However, the CEO is seeing a problem because when he gets a financial report or when he talks to the financial markets, these guys are saying, well, this company's uh, revenue per diaper are shrinking by a lot. It used to be 30 cents per diaper and it's now 25 cents per diaper. And now the CEO is completely confused because all the people who report to him are saying that things are good. Uh, but he sees a problem from the outside and this CEO does not have a team of analysts uh, or anyone to do analytical work for him. So he calls in the management consultants to see what's going on. Is someone lying to me? Am I running my company poorly? And then when these management consultants get there, they get to analyze the whole company and they see that what's actually happening is that sales are shifting to e-commerce and because e-commerce has a lower price point, the average prices of diapers are shrinking as well. Now, this may be a problem or not, but it's the type of problem that the CEO will usually discover or confirm when he gets the management consultants in. And that's the reason why mix effects are so common in consulting projects and in case interviews because you only get to see them when you're at the top of the hierarchy looking at the whole business, not just a division of it. So the bottom line for segmentation is that you should use them. They're needed, but you should use them along with other structure types. Now, what are some things to have in mind when you use segmentations? Well, there's two of them. The first thing to have in mind when using segmentations is that there's an infinite way to segment your problem. You can't go through all of them and you can't predict which one's going to bring results. So that means two things specifically. The first thing it means 
is that you can't rely on finding the right segmentation pattern to, to solve your problem. If you're relying on finding the right pattern to solve your problem, you're doomed from the start. You're counting on luck. Your interviewer is going to notice that you're counting on luck and they're going to notice that you're not systematic enough to work in consulting. So try to use segmentations along with other structure types that are more robust. Now, the second thing that this means is that when you're going to use a segmentation, instead of picking one pattern, one criterion to segment and just go with that, you can actually pick two or three. So instead of saying, I want to segment customers by age group, you can say, I want to segment customers to see if I find some patterns and I want to segment them by age group, by region and by the reason they purchase this type of product. Now you've done just as much work as asking for one segmentation. Now you're asking for three of them. So it's, the work is the same because it's the same phrase, but you have three times as, many, as much chance to actually uh, find a pattern that helps you with a hypothesis that will lead you to an answer. The second thing to be aware of when using segmentations is that although you can't predict which one is going to give you a relevant result, you can train your business intuition to find segmentation patterns that are more likely to give you a relevant result. Just like I did in the examples of segmentations in this video that I had the less insightful and the more insightful types of segmentations. How did I categorize those? Well, using my business judgment. Uh, I have a reason to believe that these are more insightful or more likely to generate insights than these ones. So you can do the same. Now, how to do it? Through deliberate practice. So whenever you segment a problem in a case interview, instead of just segmenting it, you can, after the case is done, think of other ways you could have segmented the same problem. Think of which ones would be more likely to generate some sort of relevant result and then think of why try to explain why this is more likely to generate a good result than this one so this is how you use segmentations the fourth way to be missing in the next video i'm gonna show you the fifth way to be missing opposite words it's by far the easiest way to be messy in a case interview when structuring a problem. And even though it's not the most insightful way to do it, it's a tool in our toolkit and it still has its place because it's one that can get you unstuck of many situations. Now, if you've liked this video, hit the like button, click subscribe uh, to this channel to get access to the other videos, or you can just go to our channel page and watch the videos but if you like them why not subscribe and get notified when we launch new videos and we're doing that twice a week more or less also comment in the comment section uh, if you've seen a situation of mixed effects in your cases or if you've used segmentations in a good or in a bad way before i want to hear about that so I can get your feedback on what kinds of things you guys are struggling with. Also, watch the other videos on the five ways to be missy series. In the, there's a playlist for it. There are other four ways to be missy. One of them is opposite words, which is the one coming up. And I hope you've liked this video and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you.